Good morning, everyone. How are you today? I am so excited to be here. Because when we build housing, when we build communities, we have so much opportunity to make people's lives better, to help them uh, live the best possible life that they can live. And there is so much research that has been done on how to do this effectively. And sadly, in so many examples, we continue to build places that do not meet these standards, that do not support people's health and happiness the way that they could. So today, I'm going to talk about a bit of the research that we do at Happy City, just a small fraction of these things that we can do with an audience of people who can really make this happen. So I'm extremely excited. Let me tell you about Harry Flint. This is one of the friendliest people that I've met, but he has faced some profound challenges with health and happiness in his life. It started out pretty good. He grew up in a small town, really kind of the quintessential uh, small town that we see on TV, the, the traditional Canadian town in, in Ontario. And he grew up, it was great. He would play sports all the time. He was really connected with his community. Uh, he ate well. He thought that he would be healthy and active his whole life. Although he also told me that he never thought he would turn 65 either, and that happened, so. <laughs> but then, in his 30s, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't want to cause chaos, but if there's a way to bring the lights down in the front a little bit, it would be great to bring up those uh, projections a bit. In his 30s, things started to slip. He, would, this, he lived in Calgary, and every day he would drive to work sitting in his car. He would get to his desk, and he would sit all day. Then, you know, he would go to lunch, and what was the most convenient food to get? It was right next door in the gas station. Thank you, that's perfect. And it was invariably, you know, the most accessible, easy thing. Chips, you know, junk food. And then he would go home at night and get to his apartment building, lock the front door, and not see another human being for the rest of the evening. And he got trapped in this pattern every day, sitting in his car, sitting at his desk, eating terrible food and being completely socially isolated to the point that it became harder to get exercise, harder to get himself out of this rut that he was getting in uh, because you know, this kind of problem has its own momentum. Um, and then, one day, he was in his kitchen and he felt a pain in his heart and he thought, oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack. So probably not wisely, he drove himself to the hospital. <laughs> but he got there safely. And the nurse there, she asked him, do you have a doctor? He said, no. She said, get one. You have diabetes, and your numbers just almost blew up our machine. What he told me about that that really got me was that he said to himself, what do you want to do? Do you want to die? Now, there's two ways to tell the story about what happened next. One way is personal willpower. And this is a big part of the story because not everyone can do what Harry Flint did next. He absolutely changed his life. He went home the next day from the hospital. He took all the junk food from the fridge. He threw it in the garbage bag. He threw it out. And he went for the first walk, not far, just to the end of the block and back. And then the next day walked a bit further. He got involved in uh, diabetes support groups to find out you know, what else he could do. And he heard about a marathon taking place next year in Iceland to support, uh, to fundraise for diabetes. And he said, you know what, at a time when he was still learning and regaining the capacity to you know, walk a few times around the block, he said, I am going to run that marathon, and I am going to finish it. So it's amazing. Next year, he was in Iceland. He told me he cried like a baby when he crossed that finish line. He regained his self-respect. It was beautiful talking to him. He was so proud of what he had done. 
And now he, you know, he's won the Governor General's Award. He does tons of volunteer work with Diabetes Canada, raises lots of money. He's a really amazing guy. But does willpower tell the whole story? Because here's a puzzle. Why is it that since 1958, the proportion of people who have diabetes has been going up through the roof? It used to be a rare disease. Now, 3.4 million Canadians have diabetes, by one estimate. Did everyone get lazy at once? Did everyone lose their willpower? How about this? How many people do you think, this is United States numbers, but it's similar in Canada. How many people do you think uh, meet minimum guidelines for eating well and uh, physical activity, walking 15 minutes a day, that's it? six days a week. What proportion of people, what percentage? Any guesses? 20, 15, 10%? Yeah, try 2.7%. Today, there is nothing abnormal about Harry Flint's life when he was in his 30s. Nothing abnormal. What is abnormal today is being healthy. And if that's true, something's wrong. Something needs to change. So here's a second way to tell that story about what happened to Harry Flint. The second way is, is urban design, or what I want to call defaults. What is the default? What is normal in our community? What is our housing and our communities telling us is the normal, natural way to act? You think about it from that way, when Harry Flint was young, <laughs> You know, he was active and played sports and was connected to his community and ate good food because that was normal. It was so natural. He never thought about it. It was just the way to live. When he uh, was in his 30s, this was just about the only way for him to get to work, was sitting in a car. The only thing to do at this desk is to sit. The most, and for so many people, the most affordable, convenient, accessible food is this. And as we'll discuss in more detail, the design of his apartment also made the most natural thing to do, to not see friends. It would take going out of his way consistently to stay connected with the wider community. And there's one more thing I didn't tell you. When he decided to turn his life around, what did he do? He moved to a place where he could walk to the grocery store. A place a little bit more like the community where he grew up in. He knew instinctively that he needed the help of his environment to be able to stick with that new plan, to be able to consistently walk day after day. It needed to be something useful, something about the urban fabric. So what I want to argue today is that we need to press the restore defaults button. <laughs> We need to press it hard. We need to return to a, a status where our community is consistently helping us, supporting us, and leading our best possible lives. And this is so important in, in urban areas, in rural areas, and so especially for low-income people living in affordable housing, people in apartment buildings, anywhere that we build communities that are giving them the best chance that they can possibly have of being able to look in the mirror every night and say, I am proud of who I am. Don't we all deserve that? I think so. It's our responsibility as designers for, you know, and people building communities to make that as easy as possible. So I'm from the firm Happy City. The firm got its start when uh, this uh, brilliant guy, Charles Montgomery, uh, spent almost a decade writing this book, Happy City, researching uh, basically, you know, this question among others. Uh, it's like a, a guide to how you build urban design that supports human happiness. And uh, since then, we do consulting around the world, but it, uh, we take from all kinds of disciplines, public health, psychology, neuroscience, behavioral economics, sociology, and lots of other disciplines to try to figure out how do we support happiness with our physical environment to the greatest degree possible and create a recipe for urban happiness. Today I'm going to be talking about one piece of that, which is this question of how do we make the good decisions the easy ones.
making our best life uh, accessible to us. So, to start that off, let's think about how huge of a problem we have in front of us if we think about this solely in terms of personal willpower. If, if instead of building environments that support people making good choices, we need to go out and help every single individual lead a healthier, better life. So in Finland, they did a, uh, a study where they actually teamed people up with uh, coaches and doctors and nutritionists to train them in how to uh, lead a good, healthy life. And it was successful. They actually reduced, over a 10-year period, the risk of di uh, these people contracting diabetes uh, by about one-third. So it's considered a big success. But that was for 522 people. And it wasn't cheap, you know, hiring <laughs> doctors and nutritionists, etc. It, um, it, it took five different foundations to make that project happen. Compare that to another study in a city, you may have heard of it, called Toronto, where um, they also reduced the risk of diabetes by about one-third. But it didn't cost any money, it was for free. And it keeps happening year after year. They keep reducing the risk of diabetes without any new government project funding, without any worries about sustainability of the project. And they do this for not 522 people, but for 500,000 people. So what is that? It's the neighborhood. That's the difference of the scale when we build places the right way. So is this study, it found that just three simple things had this impact on reducing diabetes. The first is having sufficiently high density. The second is having a walkable grid. And these are simple things, having streets that are well connected so you can get places. And the third is having local shops, actual useful places that you can go to near home. And I want to emphasize that this is not a solution just for big cities. It's not just in downtowns that we can have places where people can walk, where being walking can, is a useful thing that people can do day as part of their life. It is possible in suburban communities and rural communities and should be the default way that we build all communities. So if you take these two uh, communities here, these are both from my hometown, Halifax, the one on the left is a urban environment, the one on the right is a suburban one. But these two streets actually have the same density. The one on the left, though, has a walk score of 78 out of 100. And that is a measure that tells you how many things that you can walk to, how much of your life you could, you could uh, just run based on walking. And it, so this is an extremely walkable community. The one on the right is 19, meaning that it's completely car dependent. What is the difference between these two communities? That one on the right, the suburban community, actually has enough density already just be, uh, by virtue of the fact that it's a duplexes instead of single family homes. The only reason it's not walkable is because those uh, grocers, those stores are illegal. In so many of our communities, providing people with things that they can actually walk to as a part of their life is against the law. <laughs> not allowed by zoning. Think about how crazy that is. So the, if, if we change our zoning, there's so much that we can do to make our uh, rural and suburban communities healthy. And when we do build these walkable places, another thing that happens is when you're walking outside, you might run into a friend and say hi. So that's, that's the second thing, social connections. Chicago, 1995, it was a major, major heat wave. It was so hot, the road buckled, people were prying open fire hydrants to get water out, and when uh, the workers came to try to stop them from opening the fire hydrants, people actually threw rocks at them. They were very motivated <laughs> to keep that water going. It was 42 degrees Celsius. Now, tragically, this was so hot for a place not used to it that over 700 people died. This is a level of mortality usually only associated with epidemics, you know, with major disease outbreak. But this was, you know, people with heat stroke, etc. There were so many people dead 
that the city, they, the morgues were overflowing and they had to rent refrigerator trucks to take away the dead bodies. Now, a uh, epidemiologist wanted to find out what connects the people who passed away on this hot day. What is similar between them? And she went to an apartment building and she asked them, uh, can you tell me something about the, the man who died here? And the person said, uh, no, I'm afraid not, I, I never met him. And she said, oh, well, you know, there must be something that you can tell me, something. And he said, no, you don't get it. He was a nobody, knew, nobody knew him. And she, everywhere she went, she kept getting this same story. And she realized, and it broke her heart, the common connection between so many of these people who passed away that day were that they were alone. Being alone, being socially isolated, kills. First of all, because if something does go wrong, there's nobody to notice, there's nobody to call the ambulance, uh, nobody checking in. But second of all, being alone releases stress hormones. It's very, very hard in the body. It's relatively new science, but they're realizing that um, if you, being socially isolated, raises the risk of death by all causes by about the same amount as being morbidly obese. It's up there with inactivity and smoking. But what do we do about that? If we treated this problem the same way that we treat the obesity <coughs> epidemic, we'd be doing education campaigns telling everyone that you should really have more friends. You know, but that's not gonna work. We can't coach people on how to make more friends. We need to go to the root of the issue and ask, what is the physical environment that will support people in making strong social bonds? So what works? Well, the uh, communities in Chicago where far few, fewer people passed away and there's far fewer rates of loneliness were communities that, like we've already been saying, are walkable, where there are places to go outside. Because guess what? When you are outside with your human body, you can actually run into people. You can see friends. There's a chance for encounters. So that's thing number one, is exposure. Now, this town here, the one photograph, this is actually Seaside, Florida. This is a place that has done this very, very well. They've, you know, There's a whole list of things you need to do, and they check a lot of the boxes. And when sociologists go here and check on social connections, excuse me, they have a remarkably high rate of social bonds. This is the kind of place that they report, you know, when you move in, uh, people come, uh, neighbors come over with pie. You know, <laughs> people are asking each other, how can I help them? People stop each other in the street and talk. Uh, incidentally, does anyone recognize this from a movie? That scene? No? So, yes. Truman Show, that's right. <laughs> so this was a smart growth development that uh, was built in the 80s. It was so pristine and picturesque that when they wanted you know, the quintessential pristine community for the Truman Show, they filmed it here. Um, but they really have done this right in terms of supporting social connections. Now there's, there's a big list of things. I'm just going to zero in on one critical element. And that is, what happens when you open up your front door at night and you go in? What are the chances that in all the time that you spend at home in your life, that you are going to run into a friend or meet someone new? For most people in most homes, the only way that would happen is if there is a robbery. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's funny because my second year of university, I was wondering, I was, you know, every single day at home, studying in my room, that's basically all I did, and I wondered, why aren't I meeting any girls? <laughs> and then I realized at some point, oh yeah, right, a girl would actually have to break in through my bedroom window for me to meet her. <laughs> I wasn't getting out. There needs to be this element of exposure. So one way to fix that is an ancient technology called the porch. This is a house from uh, here in Manitoba. But this porch isn't going to do it. What's wrong with this porch? It's too far back. So it doesn't actually meet the need of exposure because to have a casual conversation, you need a megaphone. <laughs> but this porch doesn't work either. What's wrong with this porch? There's a barrier. 
You can definitely see people though. What's wrong? People, it's not too far from the door. Is that? Elevation. Elevation is actually okay. It's not too high up. There might be an accessibility issue, but you can. I think it is accessible. Well, they need more chairs. It's actually too exposed. It's right on the street. We gotta remember something, okay? It's not just by chance that we're all so socially isolated nowadays. We built our homes and our communities this way for a reason. Isolation is the flip side of something we want. Privacy. Isolation is the result of building for too much privacy, just as inactivity is the result for building for too much convenience. It's the exact same problem. So when we come up with solutions for these issues, we need to still recognize the need for these things. So you still need to recognize people's need for privacy. And if you are right there on the sidewalk where people are so close that they can see what you're reading, people don't spend time up there. Yes? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I could go on a long time about that part of the street in particular. It's a blank wall on the other side of the street, and I'll be talking about that soon. How that is, that blank wall is one of the worst things you can do to a street. It pushes people away. So, that's a good point. This is what they did in Seaside. This is your porridge that's just warm enough. It is about, here's the magic number, 10 to 15 feet from the street, where you can um, relax and have privacy and let the world go by without them being in your business and just do your own thing. But if you see someone that you want to chat with, you can absolutely have a casual conversation. It's just the right distance. And this is the way that we used to build communities. It also needs to be big enough. <laughs> a lot of porches today, you barely have enough room to put your rubber boots. I was in Toronto and I was walking through a community, and I noticed that they had porches exactly this way, exactly the right distance, just what the research was saying is the kind that supports socialization. And so I uh, accosted a poor lady who was sitting on a porch there, which is very easy because it was just the right distance. And, um, <laughs> and I asked her if I could ask her a few questions, and she told me that her friend, who used to live right next door, moved to a new community. And in the new community, nobody knows each other. Whereas in this community, Everyone was super connected and it was easy to be. It happened without even thinking about it because people saw each other all the time because they would spend time outside, they would see their friends. They have a um, festival every year and if it rains, everybody retreats onto the porches, they share their spaces on the porches and uh, they're able to connect in that way. So this is a totally connected community. And you think about it, all these people in the world right now who are sitting at home alone, none of them are saying, Darn you urban planners <laughs> for making me alone. People feel like it's their fault that they're not socially connected. They don't realize that if they lived in a different place, without even thinking about it, they would make friends all the time. They would know the people living near them if their community was just built a bit differently. And that's why our responsibility matters so much, that we do meet those needs. Now, some of the affordable housing that gets built is in the form of apartment towers. So there's, there's so much on this, but I'm just gonna mention one or two things about how to make um, apartments that really support social connections. Because apartments is paradoxical. These places are where people are most likely to feel both lonely and crowded at the same time. That is a nasty mix. How do we fix that? Well. One thing is to have semi-private public space, right? Like places where the people who live there can, can connect, right? But it so rarely works. Let me give you an example. This, this isn't even an unfair example. So many of them are like this. I mean, first of all, clearly the design is very bad. No one would want to use that field with, with absolutely nothing on it. There's an exposure issue there too much. But there's also, that space is shared by over 60 units in that apartment building. And that is so many people that the, the people don't know the other people in the apartment building. And so that space is owned by so many people, it feels like it's owned by nobody. 
That is nobody's responsibility. So nobody feels comfortable spending time there. And what happens again and again and with apartment buildings around the world is that these spaces become underused, vandalized, they become, can become very dangerous, very unsightly. So this, this is not the way you do it. Now compare that to this. Again, part of it is design. This is obviously a very attractive design, but there are ways to build very affordable units that mimic the, the basic attributes of what's going on here. But imagine, in the center of that courtyard there, it would feel very relaxed and normal to spend time there. In part, it's because there's about 12 units sharing that space. So you know the other people who are sharing it. It's not shared anonymously. This is shared by a very specific group of people, and collectively that specific group of people uh, have a sense of ownership and responsibility for maintaining that space and for making each other feel welcome there. It also has that critical element of exposure and retreat. The fact that you can be, when you feel like it, out in a place where you might see friends. And you know what? When you don't feel like it, you can go back into your unit and have that critical privacy. So this is how you get the mix right. But, just like corner stores, this is illegal. <laughs> so many things that we need to support people's health, people's social connections, are not allowed by zoning in most communities. What is going on? We need to change this. For the last half century, we've been very good at building single family homes. We've been very good at building tall apartment buildings, but we're missing everything in the middle. All of the townhouses, all of the courtyard housing, all of the multifamily uh, development types that can support, uh, that can be very affordable, because it's a lot of people living in the same building, but that, did, that better supports people's social connection and shared semi-private public space. Now I mentioned with both the good and the bad that design matters, right? And for both help and socialization, if the physical design of the place doesn't make people feel comfortable, feel natural to walk, to talk to each other, they won't. But we have lost so much progress on this issue of trying to design places that feel comfortable and enticing because of this idea that, well, you know, <laughs> beauty is to the beholder, right? It's all just subjective. Maybe for some people this would be wonderful. That's why, thank goodness, we're finally starting to get beyond this debate. How? By getting objective evidence by actually slapping biometric meters on people's wrists and seeing how they physically, physiologically respond to different environments. We can actually find out, this is uh, work done by Colin Ellard at uh, Waterloo University, it's absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, so he actually, he, he uh, had volunteers go out in New York and see which kind of places do they respond to well, which places stress them out, which places make them feel happy. And this is an example of a kind of place that feel, people feel very comfortable in, despite the fact that you know, this is an you know, old chaotic jumble, but there's variation, there's interesting things to look at, there are window, there's human activity, it feels like an environment where humans belong. In contrast, when people walked by this Whole Foods store where windows were frosted and it was a completely blank wall, people felt very unhappy there. You know, and, and there is taste. There is such thing as individual taste for building design. There is also such thing as certain design elements that objectively impact human beings no matter where you're from, who you are. And one of the things is you need active walls. You can't uh, have storefronts like the, or um, blank walls like this. Um, the famous architect Jan Gell actually did research and found that with blank walls, people start to walk faster. <laughs> they want to get out of there. That's how much it impacts people's psyche. So we wondered, okay, if this makes people uncomfortable and, and unhappy, what kind of impact does that have on them behaviorally? How does it impact? human interaction. 
And so we had people go out into the city of Seattle with maps and look completely baffled and lost. Basically project out there that, you know, rob me, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so, and we put this person in um, an environment on the left that has that kind of active frontage, which is this inviting kind of environment, or on the right, in an area with completely blank walls. It feels, you know, hostile. It doesn't feel like a comfortable place where people want to live. Be. And not to be too clickbait about this, but the results will blow your mind. <laughs> the number of people who stopped, four times more. The number of people who uh, would get out their phone and help people with their phone, many, many times more. But the, my favorite part is that people who would actually physically guide people where they were going was almost four times as many. Huge, huge difference. When you are in an environment that feels inviting, it feels natural to interact with your fellow human being. You feel more trusting. You feel happier. One of my goals with this talk is to emphasize that this is not just something that happens in downtown New York. Not just something in cities. This is a um, small uh, uh, Manitoba town. Now, I promised myself that I was going to remember its name. <laughs> Minda. Mindedosa. Yeah, that's right. And so there are pieces of this kind of active store frontage there. Unfortunately, you know, there's there's blanks in between that need to be restored. Uh, but there is so much potential in so many small towns here in Manitoba where we can create exactly this kind of environment that is so positive in helping people uh, engage in really a positive, healthy, social, connected, happy behavior. And this is such a big impact on the economy. Walkable communities across the board have more GDP growth. And that is for a lot of reasons many of which I'll uh, be talking about in tonight's talk, but I'll be talking more about the economic impacts of this stuff. Um, but one of the critical reasons is because of who it attracts. Who wants to live in these places? Millennials, people my age, they're driving a quarter less than baby boomers. So the way we build communities needs to take that into consideration. 42% of them want to live in urban communities, but not all of them do. It's not that everybody wants to live downtown. A quarter of them just want to live in any suburban, rural, whatever community that has that kind of mixed use. They, they understand intuitively that they want a place that's going to help them lead their best life. And why wouldn't they, right? And guess what companies are doing? Smart Growth America surveyed 500 companies that moved in the last few years to places that support more walking, more transit, and more cycling. The number one reason that they gave was to follow that town, follow the young people, which is totally natural. I mean, think about it. If you're a uh, paper mill, you want to locate next to the forest, right? You want your natural resources near the factory. Well, what if your natural resource is brilliance, is people? Well, then you want to move to the places that offer people a great quality of life. For many rural communities in Manitoba, a big goal is to attract new, uh, new Canadians, people just arriving in the country. And the top priority of new Canadians has been found to be, and this is a survey down in the Prairie Provinces, number one was employment opportunities. Uh, the third on the list is quality of life. All of these issues that we've been talking about today. Now, for employment, what kind of place offers new Canadians, and as well, this applies equally to low-income people that so many of us here serve today, what offers them the best chances at getting a leg up? Well, the number one thing is everything that I've been talking about. Unsurprisingly, the more jobs that are within walking distance of your home, guess what? <laughs> the faster people find work, right? I mean, it's, it's so obvious when you say it out loud, but people really do better. They get off welfare faster. They uh, re-enter the workforce faster when there are jobs near home. Now, Douglas Saunders, 
is a researcher and a, a columnist with the Global Mail. He uh, wrote this great book, Arrival City, and found that it used to be that new Canadians arriving would uh, move to uh, neighborhoods like this, Chinatown in Toronto, where there was all kinds of businesses mixed in with residential. That meant three things. First of all, really low cost to buy groceries because you just walk out your front door and buy them. You don't need a car, so life had a very, very low cost of living. Second of all, they could get that job, like I mentioned. Third of all, and this is critical, especially for new Canadians, they could start their own business. There was a place that they could do that. It was offered in the urban fabric. These places are getting more and more expensive. And a lot of new Canadians are being forced out into apartment buildings like on the right, where it's, it's affordable, but the cost of living isn't affordable. There's, there's no stores nearby. It's uh, hard to reach employment, which makes it hard to hold down a job. There is zero opportunity in that urban fabric for them to start their own business. And what Douglas Saunders found is that when new arrivals lived in communities like Chinatown, guess how long it took for them to get out of that first rung of the economic ladder and firmly get themselves into the middle class? It's about one generation. These were machines for turning uh, for creating success stories. In these other communities, in the suburbs of Paris, so many places of the world, and now Canada, poverty becomes ingrained. For new Canadians and low-income people, poverty becomes something that reproduces itself generation after generation after generation. That is a problem. So, just have one or two things to, to wrap up here. Um, you know, when I see a talk, one of the most important things to me is that there's actually something practical that I can do with it. <laughs> and I hope that I've given you some useful tools today. Um, but everything that I was saying about apartment buildings, how we build apartment buildings to support socialization, we actually have on our website a free tool called the Happy Homes Toolkit that you can go and download absolutely for free, and it is an awesome resource. I mentioned like one idea, that was it. This thing is full of ideas about how you build places that are socially connected and support health and well-being. So I really encourage you to check that out. Also, uh, you know, if you are doing a project and need more intensive support, we are a consulting firm, we would love to help you out. And I want to give you one last example of a rural community that shows that this is possible. So we worked on a master plan in Bridgewater, a small town in Nova Scotia. So it was a 15 minute walk from the downtown, old, old uh, golf course. The original plan for the site was gonna be total single family home car dependent suburbia. We proposed something different. Why don't we do this? Create a new town square with commercial at the center and this absolutely meets those density targets to support commercial um, mixed use so people can walk for most of what they do, about 56 people per hectare. 35 is the minimum that you need, jobs and people. With, when you add in jobs, probably be 80 to 100 people per hectare, very, very high density. But we got that with just a few four-story apartment buildings in the center, and everything else, two-thirds of the site, was single-family home duplexes and townhouses. So we do not, this is not something just for downtowns. This is something for every single community. This is how we should be building everything that we build. Because doesn't everyone deserve to be able to live a healthy life, a socially connected life, a happy life where every single day they can say, I am so proud of who I am. It shouldn't be necessary for every single person to become an expert in how to overcome the barriers of their communities to try to lead a healthy, daily, happy lifestyle. It is our responsibility to build communities that offer people that chance to live an absolutely wonderful life. And I so hope that you take some of the lessons from today and make that happen. Thank you very much.
So uh, how are we doing for time? Uh, take a few questions. Yeah, about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> Shoot, I wanted to leave more time. I love taking questions. Would anyone see that there's two mics here, if anyone would like to approach them? And... Oh, I guess I already answered all of your questions. <laughs> Is that turned on? I think there's a little switch there. <coughs> Modern technology exists to baffle us. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, have you read the book, Street Fight? Yes. I okay. love it. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> Wonderful. Right along what you're speaking of. Yes. It talks about how New York is now such a desirable city. Yes. Globally because it's gone back to the people. Yes. So get a copy. Yes, and so um, Sadiq Khan, the uh, former transportation planner of New York, wrote this book, Street Fight. And what's beautiful about that book is that she shows that the critical thing is to show the evidence, to show how many more people can use a street when you actually take space in the street and give it back to pedestrians and create dedicated space for people on bikes and create place so that a street isn't just what they call a traffic sewer. I love that expression. Uh, not just a place to get as quickly as possible from one place to somewhere else, but a place in its own right where people want to spend time. And uh, it, what was critical to that was the evidence on the impact this has, again, on, on health and happiness and the number of people using the street, but also that it didn't make traffic worse. Often, by rationalizing how we are using the space, you can keep that traffic throughput at a steady pace. I mean, the fact is, in the center of an urban environment, you know, it won't make a difference whether you're driving 50k an hour to get to the arterial, or 30 or 40k an hour. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. And so we can create these safe, welcoming streets that really do so much for making a, a wonderful, happy city. Thanks for bringing that up. enterprises throughout the community. Um, many communities felt uh, that had those mom and pop shops, restaurants, whatever, but then the Walmarts moved in. And, and there that went. So it's more than just having uh, somebody brave enough to open up a little grocery store. They would have to have some kind of relief from the town or the city in terms of property taxes or other things to alleviate because it can't be competitive. Right? Yeah. Do you oh, have absolutely. another solution? Yes, yeah, no, that's, there's a number of solutions to this issue, and, and you're absolutely right. One of the solutions is that um, we do need to hit higher, um, not, not towers, but we do need to hit higher targets of people living really close to those communities, and it really does need to be people living within walking distance of the businesses, because if people are riding at the businesses by car, then it's equally, it's actually easier for them to drive to the Walmart because there's way more parking and it's way cheaper, right? And so, um, I, I, oh, I have a slide right here. <laughs> I'm so prepared. <laughs> Um, so this is a slide showing um, how much people spend in, in Portland if they arrive at local businesses and grocery stores, restaurants, etc. by car, walking or biking. And what they found is that people who arrive by car spend more on each trip, but people who walk or bike arrive more often and generally actually spend more over time because they are loyal customers, right? It is an inbuilt loyal customer base. Otherwise, these mom and pop shops are competing with every other store in the entire city. On taxes, I want to speak very briefly on the flawed logic and how we handle taxes right now. Um, we uh, tax downtown businesses based on the advantage that they have, which is the convenience that having many land uses on a small amount of land grants people the fact that they can walk to, to so many stores at the same time. Um, we do not tax big box stores based on their advantage, which is free access to um, uh, freeways, to massive space, provide parking. Um, and so they both have advantages. One is being taxed, the other is not. And so my recommendation is to actually tax based on walk score. Because the lower the walk score in the area of a business, 
the uh, more people will be driving, the more that they will be causing wear and tear on the urban infrastructure, that they'll be creating traffic, that they'll be creating pollution, that people will be breathing in. They create so many costs. And so the more that we, uh, the business community, can succeed in making place, work with us to make places that are really, really walkable, that achieve a high walk score, the more that they'll be lowering costs for all of us. So taxing that creates the right set of incentives. Yes. Hi, uh, Mayor Randy Warnick from the Art and I'm one of the guys we have munchies with later. Great, pleasure to meet you. Uh, yeah. I represent one of the oldest communities in the province oh. at 58.7, third oldest in Canada. Uh, and I, I like your talk about millennials, but how do you motivate those um, people with your walkability scores? And one of the issues I'm dealing with now in the last four years is trying to bring that wellness to our community, but yet we're on the high end of that diabetes score. Mm. So there have been studies on that. Like this is a real struggle for us in council because of that age. And basically, we're a retirement community. Yeah. So how do we? Do you have any suggestions? Absolutely. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, it's really hard. It's hard to get from here to there because once you're there. Once you have a community with a really wonderful Main Street, then everybody wants to move there. Everyone wants to move there so bad that it's gentrification and all the low-income people get pushed out. <laughs> but um, when there's so many holes bet in between businesses and our streets are really wide and so much streetscaping needs to happen, it's, it's hard to get there. I'll be talking a bit tonight about how we can think about the um, self-perpetuating feedback loop of if we take all of the uh, funds that we get from these highly efficient main streets and reinvest them continuously back into the quality of the main street, then that can um, start to create that momentum. For getting young people there, it's so critical to have a strong vision of what is going to be built. My favorite part, when we held a public consultation on this uh, development, I'm used to develop uh, people responding to developments with pure anger. In this case, everyone was writing, yes, do it, <laughs> good idea, I couldn't believe my eyes. And uh, my favorite comment of the bunch was from a young person who said, I always wanted to live in the community in Gilmore Girls. Maybe now I can. <laughs> and so um, by saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, and here is how we're going to get there. I, I hope that that um, will help create that momentum. But um, it, is, it is an enormous challenge, and it's something that this entire profession needs to work on more, uh, because there are so many good ideas out there that just can't get past that first hurdle, you know, that it's um, until there's a certain level of quality going on, there's not the property values to make it worthwhile to invest in uh, new great projects sometimes. And so like, how do you get the ball rolling? But again, when I talk tonight, we'll hit on a bit more of the uh, self-sustaining feedback loops. Hi, uh, I'm just curious how you balance, because you talk about uh, doing new sites and almost doing kind of like a self-contained kind of community and you know, people don't have to go very far. But uh, I know, like I grew up in a small town and I love that idea. <laughs> Um, but I know I, I now live in Winnipeg, and it, it does struggle with maintaining a vibrant downtown. And kind of at the end of the workday, people just vacate the place. So I'm curious, how do you balance with the overall uh, city plan? Um, you know, creating enough of the essentials in the neighborhood, but uh, not, uh, you know, taking away from the vibrancy of other neighborhoods as well, and keeping it interconnected. So I wonder if you have any suggestions for that balance. Yeah, sure, great question. So what I was talking about today is what I call the local serving economy. The closer, the, the more often that you need something, bread, the closer it should be at all. A bread, we need it so often, it should be within a short walk of home. It, having to drive to buy bread, is like having to drive to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's how inefficient it is. And so the city center, the regional center, doesn't need to be for things that people need every single day. That can offer the stuff that people go and buy once a week or once a month. It can offer the nightlife. It can offer all these things. And for the community that lives there in the center, it can offer them that local serving economy. But what we need are cities, communities of collections 
of uh, homes with their own identity, their own main street at the heart of them, with their own uh, local serving businesses, with that uh, local customer base, those loyal customers, um, and as well as a strong regional center that complements everything that people don't need every day, but that they do need regularly. And so they, they really aren't in competition in my mind. They really do complement each other. We didn't talk about transit today, but when you wrap all of this around a strong transit plan where, um, uh, where people uh, go to move around the city, they're also buying goods there while they go. This is also part of how you sustain these local economies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions.